don't see a hand. <laughs> oh, Betty Jean. I'd like to ask, because I get your letter uh, for Edward and how things are moving along, because I was really impressed by your recent uh, activity for your ministry, uh, with, with the ministry of God being moved so quickly in the radio, radio station and the materials going out. And I'd like the other people, I want everybody here to hear the good news of how, how it's growing. You're, the ministry is super, and, and God is really moving mightily in, in that triumph, truth triumphant and Africa. And, and the local countries near them. You know, Betty Jean, the, uh, the work in Africa is going wonderfully. Um, I feel very fortunate, and, and I believe God led for me to be able to work with Edward Katiba. Uh, he's from Zambia, and uh, we've been on the radio over there now for about, I don't know how long, Betty Jean, but it's been a number of years, and uh, we have just so many reports of Roman Catholics, uh, apostate Protestants, Muslims, uh, heathen soldiers, policemen, government officials that are either openly or secretly embracing the three angels' messages. Amen. Amen. And uh, Betty, Jean, you know, people have died. Priests have died who accepted the truth, mm -hmm. and then they were killed for doing that. Uh, the owner of the first radio station we were on, Mr. Gordon, uh, he was definitely killed yeah. um, in an audio, uh, uh, automobile crash. Um, but the truth of God is going forward, Betty Jean, in, a, in an amazing way. You know, right now, Betty Jean, uh, the president who got into office illegally, Lungu, uh, is arresting the um, opponent, his his political opponent in the country. And the man is a Seventh Day Adventist. His name is Hachalima, and uh, but Hachalima's followers have said, if he is put into prison, there will be a civil war. Wow. So, you know, Betty Jean, whenever war breaks out. Nobody wins. That's right. And I feel like because of the papacy's hatred for what we have, are doing on the radio, and Betty Jean, you know, we've had testimonies of Catholic churches that are diminishing to almost nothing Amen. because their members are leaving in droves to become Seventh-day Adventists. Wow. I love your letters. You I, so, love, I love the updates. Praise the Lord, Betty Jean. And yeah. I think the other thing Sign that... Up. Go ahead. Sign up for Bill Hughes' letters, please. If you want to keep up to date and gain an understanding of what God's power and, and, and a mighty ministry like this, you get an up-to-date information is awesome. One, one thing, Betty Jean, I, that I'm really excited about, too, is um, I've got uh, a young couple that have been in the church in my little church in Florida for about a year now and they're very high tech uh, and they came to me here several months ago and said you have DVDs of sermons you've done for years in that storage room I said yeah right there in the DVD room where we make copies they said we want a copy of everything and we want to put them on YouTube. And a new yeah. open site that you have on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, a new channel on YouTube called Truth Triumphant. Go to YouTube, guys. And Betty Jean, we've got studies in Daniel, Revelation, Hebrews, the closing scenes of Jesus' life, Ezekiel, uh, and just a host of... The, the gentleman, Cody, was telling me we have over 300 DVDs that he has uploaded to YouTube. And it, it Betty Jean, I, I don't grasp. <laughs> what God's doing. I, I, do, I just, see, when we started it, of course, it, it takes time. You know, people run to it. They find it. But Betty Jean, in the last month, that thing has jumped from like, Five or 6,000 views, you know, people watching. 
Now it's up to 15,000. That was fast from your letter. Yeah. Your letter was saying about 5,000. That's up to 15,000 already It's up to 15,000, yeah. Wow, beautiful. And, you know, I, I asked him, I said, put, put down the different countries that you know we're getting responses from. <laughs> I love it. Betty Jean, we're getting them from South Korea, the Philippines, the Netherlands, the U.K., I think, I know, I got a phone call from a guy in Brazil uh, Wednesday afternoon when I was getting ready for the meeting Wednesday night. Brazil, he says, Pastor Bill, you know, I, I saw a DVD on YouTube. Awesome. What a blessing, you know. And so, Betty Jean, all I can say, it's like what I said last night. My prayer is, Lord, just keep me out of the way. Just keep me out of the way because Amen. it's God's work. That's right. And if I just stay out of the way, he, he can do wonders. Beautiful. Can do wonders. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? What's the website? It's, it's Truth Triumphant. Is that? Yeah, it's, Triumphant. it's not a website. It's YouTube. If you go to YouTube. Oh, no, but I mean to sign up for the letter. Oh, oh. to sign up for my newsletter. Can we hand around a sheet, Pastor? Uh, maybe, but Brother Duga Duga, can you help me uh, get in a couple of blocks of paper and some pens so we can uh, ask the folks to sign sign for it? And, and can you yeah. send our love to Hoda? Absolutely, family, please. And, and I miss her. I will tell her that. I hope she can come back. I will tell her with you. I get two newsletters Jean. from you. What, what can I do to get one taken off to save you postage? Send me an email, Jean. And just tell me, say, I'm getting two newsletters, ax one of them, and I'll do it. All right, the young lady over here. I'm talking about you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel so young anymore, but <laughs> anyway, um, I was just wondering about Revelation 2, 17, that you talked about last night. Yes, And it talked about uh, one of the things that the the saved will receive a white stone and a stone, let's see, and a new name written. And you said the new name represented what? I used Jerry as the illustration Jacob. Uh -huh. That Jacob in his conquest of doing things his way to letting God do it his way. God changed his name. And so the changing, the giving of a new name is a sign of self-conquest through faith in the power of God. I was just wondering if it could also represent a new character. Absolutely. Since, since your name is your character, right? Absolutely. Well, you know, Jerry, in the, in the story of Jacob in Genesis 32, Jacob was deceiver, trickster the new name represented a new character. He was a prince. He had power with God, and he prevailed. So it, it did. It represented a transformation of character. You know, I want to especially, especially thank you for that sermon. Praise Amen. the Lord, Jerry. Amen. You know, Jerry, there was a lady that sent me an email <laughs> that's in this room. It just asked me a question. Jerry wrote me a couple of months ago, and she said, I'd love to hear a sermon on the, to him that overcome it. So, happy to do it. Happy to do it. Somebody else. Yes, sir. And your name? Uh, Arthur. Arthur, from yes. San Diego. From San Diego, yes. All right, Arthur, no, go so, ahead. Uh, so, thank you for coming again. Uh, I was here the last time you were here, and it uh, I want to say thank you for coming back. Um, I think I remember telling you that I first read The Secret Terrorists back in 2002 when I lived in Texas, and that's how I got to know of your uh, Truth Triumphant Ministries and um, been following it ever since. And it's, man, I, I, I'm so impressed with what God's been doing using you, and it's been a blessing to me personally and to a lot of people that I've been able to show the books and share with them these Amen. things. So um, praise, praise the, Lord. the Lord for that, I want to say. Amen, Arthur. Uh, but I do have, um, I got two questions, actually. The first one is, um, 
is to do with uh, something that uh, uh, Talisha here asked you yesterday about um, uh, the King James version of the Bible. And it's, it's not so much the King James version of the Bible. I was wondering if you could kind of dive into what the Textus Receptus branch of, you know, the, the translations and um, the accuracy of it with the Greek text because, um, you know, we, had, we were given a presentation about the Textus Receptus last week um, at our church by our pastor um, in Claremont, SDA. Um, and he was, he was not going against it, but what he was saying is that even the Texas Receptus has mistakes in it and that there is words added to certain verses, and that was due to the actual translator that put together the Texas Receptus. Um, but he was advocating New King James. So... I wonder if you can maybe just clarify that aspect of it and also, um, you know, because we don't have the original manuscripts, of course. Correct. Um, but how do we know that this is the, you know, the most accurate translation of the New Testament and the Word of God that we can trust? Good. Great question, Arthur. Number one, Arthur, I would encourage everyone to get the book, The Authorized Bible Vindicated, by B.G. Wilkinson. Okay? The Authorized Bible Vindicated, Dr. B.G. Wilkinson. Fantastic book. Fantastic book. What Dr. Wilkinson historically lays out, Arthur, all Bibles originated with the Textus Receptus, okay? There were two streams that developed over time. There was the Syrian branch of Christianity that maintained the Textus Receptus. It was passed on. The Waldenses embraced it. The translation that Wycliffe came out with, his translation was from the Textus Receptus. You come all the way down, Erasmus in the 16th century used the Textus Receptus to translate the New Testament into Greek. Okay? The people who put together the King James Bible used and were in that stream. Okay? And so we have the King James that's come all the way down, Arthur, from the apostles through the Syrian church, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, Wycliffe, Erasmus, the Reformation, to the King James Bible. Okay? That's one stream. There's another stream too, Arthur. From the Textus Receptus, the Alexandrian fathers like Clement, Origen, uh, they started allegorizing scripture. They read into what they wanted it to say, and they made allegory out of the Bible. From them, it went to Jerome, who was a, a Catholic. The Vulgate came through there. Then you have, in the 16th century, the Douay version, which was the Jesuit Bible. Same stream. You then come down to the 19th century with Westcott and Hort. And they introduce the, uh, the revised version, revised standard. From there you have, and I don't know the exact time, Arthur, but you have the New American Standard Bible, the NIV, and you have the New King James. Arthur, you have two streams. There they are. And Dr. Wilkinson, he was a, a firm Seventh-day Adventist in the 30s, 40s, 50s. 
lays that, those two streams out beautifully in his book. So the new... The, the authorized Bible vindicated. So is the new King James not part of the Texas Receptus stream? Or is it just a different... It is, but it's a different branch, right? See, Arthur, all Bibles, Arthur, originated with the Texas Receptus. From the, okay. You okay. see? Okay. But they diverged. they diverged. Right about the third century, the I Syrian see. church, they maintained the authority and the beauty of the Textus Receptus. The Alexandrian fathers, Clement and Origen, they started allegorizing scripture mm. and making it say whatever they wanted it to. So they both originated with the Textus Receptus but they divided about the third century. And now today, we have two streams. Was, was the... Um, Walter Weith made a presentation, the uh, Battle of the Bibles, I think. Was, yes. the, was, was that a very good uh, overview of, of those? Because I think he, he presented like three streams with Codus, Codex, a left, I think, on one side, and then the other ones over here, and that, that's pretty clear. You you say? It's very good. Okay, very, very good. Very good. So I just have the second question yeah. that I want. I, want <laughs> I, I just want you to to maybe if you can put your imp if you, if you know about this, right? So yeah. um, Russia has been pushing a lot of. Um, uh, laws um, they've they've banned evangelizing um, in the country uh, you are only allowed to evangelize in the church which is really not evangelizing you're just preaching to you know your congregation there but um, it's now illegal to basically have a Bible study right and you can't be evangelizing in the street and just last week they they banned Jehovah's Witness as an extremist group and I believe it has to do with how they are so hard-lined against the uh, Russian Orthodox Church and because of this they've been you know put in the crosshairs of the government and so now they are being persecuted essentially and they can't have their faith in their country um, I was wondering if you could maybe just elaborate that as to how similar that looks to be, um, you know, our future in, in the coming future. Arthur, any time any group has their religious freedom restricted, that is a threat to anybody's religious faith. So for that to take place in Russia, Russia is simply reenacting what they were doing years ago through Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, right up. And then, of course, with Gorbachev, there was kind of a relaxing with perestroika, and he kind of wanted to appear like he was open-minded. And God allowed that and led in that to open Russia up to the three angels' Amen. messages. Amen. And now, Arthur, the door's shutting. And it's going to make it more difficult for Seventh-day Adventists in Russia to proclaim the three angels' messages. So, but let's face it, Arthur, whenever anybody's freedom to worship God is, is attacked, nobody's religious freedom is, is guaranteed. I, who was next? I don't know. Yes, sir. And your name? Douglas. Douglas, please. Uh, just want to know if you've heard anything. I haven't heard anything on the news, but now that we have a full Supreme Court, is there anything coming with regards to breaking down separation? Douglas, Scalia that Gorsuch replaced, obviously Scalia was a Catholic devout. Neil Gorsuch, which the press has not uh, discussed, Gorsuch went to Georgetown Preparatory School in Washington, D.C., which is a Jesuit preparatory school. So Gorsuch has been trained, at least in his high school years, by the Jesuits, 
has, has learned that they are master and they are authority. Also, Douglas, on the Supreme Court, you've got Roberts, the Chief Justice, Catholic, Kennedy Catholic, Sotomayor Catholic, Kennedy Catholic. Um, Ginsburg is a Jew, but she's a CFR member. And the CFR is controlled by the Jesuit order. Now, I'm missing Clarence Thomas is a Catholic. So, Douglas, the Supreme Court justice is filled with Roman Catholics and a couple of CFR members. So, when Sunday laws or church and state are agitated, Douglas, they will have no problem destroying the wall of separation. I mean, Douglas, William Rehnquist back in the 1990s said the wall of separation of church and state is a metaphor based on bad history that must be abandoned. So, and Douglas, you know, we didn't talk about it this afternoon, but um, Donald Trump, from the executive branch of government, he made it very clear to evangelicals. He said, if you put me in the White House, which they did, it was the evangelical vote that put Trump in the White House. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, and I've got the quote if you want it, uh, just I could give you my email, send me an email and ask me for the quote. But Donald Trump says, if you put me in the White House, I will use my office to destroy the wall of separation of church and state. So, Douglas, the table's set. The table's set. It's just a matter of the Lord saying, hold it a little longer so that my children can be ready. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Okay. Pastor Cortez, what do we got? Let's go, let's, let's try one over here. Let's go to Adrian, and then do we have, okay, then we'll go to Rhonda up here. Pastor, we got Rhonda up here has been waiting very patiently. Yeah, I have one right here. At least that's what she tells me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, Adrian, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I gave um, it to Rhonda. The conference churches are here. They're having a big meeting at the, I believe, at the Greek Theater. All conference churches in I think in Southern California. Have, you, have anybody heard anything about that? Um, it's supposed to be I don't know if it's next Sabbath or the following and I was just wondering if, I guess no one heard about it yet. Yeah, my mom was they're going to have all speakers from all over but they want they're encouraging every church to come. Every ch conference church to attend. And I was like, they all going to get hypnotized. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Adrian, the, the Lord is good. And um, if we find ourselves in a meeting like that, the Holy Spirit is able within about two to three minutes to make it really clear if we're listening to what's being said, to be able to discern if it's good or if it's bad, Amen. if it's true or if it's error. I remember, Adrian, years ago, somebody invited me to go hear a man by the name of Charles Wheeling uh, in St. Helena, California. And he got up. I'd never heard him speak before. He's handed out a lot of great controversies, which is great. But he got up there in the St. Helena Church, and uh, within the first five minutes, he had dismantled the historical interpretation of Daniel chapter 7, wow. where he said the, the lion of Daniel 7, 4 was, I don't remember, but he was applying them to nations now. Like one of them was England, one of them, like the uh, bear was America, and the leopard was somebody else. And Adrian, 
within five minutes, I turned to the people that I was with and I said, I'll be waiting for you outside. I can't listen to any more of this. And I left. So if you went to those meetings, Adrian, the Holy Spirit will help you within five minutes to know exactly what spirit rules in that room. <laughs> you remember it, John. I guess you do. Okay. Okay. St. Helena, 1984. Okay. There you go. Okay. Just one thing. Yeah. You know, I went to one of his meetings here in Riverside, and when he started saying the thing, things you did, and I, I have a question, and I asked him if, uh, I said, did I hear it right that you said that the pioneers made a mistake uh, uh, saying that Christ passed from the holy to the most holy in 1844, or, uh, October 22? And he says, that's right, that's what I said. I said, well, this is not my meeting. And I stood up, and I walked, and I, and I went through the center of the aisle, and I looked at people that were displeased, and they were following me all the way out. <laughs> on the, but the point that I was going to make is this. With my wife, we went in the car, and uh, we felt that an evil spirit had followed us. We were so agitated, we couldn't uh, explain it. And we were praying and singing for an hour until wow. the spirit left us wow. from that meeting. Amen, wow. Pastor Cortez. Amen. I just have, it's more of a short comment. I put it on Facebook, so I'm sure there's going to be some more um, Adventists. I have up to, I think I have 9,000 or so, and, and at least 90% of those are current Adventists, backslidden, or secret Adventists, some kind of category. So I'm sure that more people are going to block me. Um, but I put up, my question to you is just, did you see with um, Bill O'Reilly, I'm not going to debate his personal life and his personal uh, problems, right. but he he immediately went to the Pope. And for those of us who know who the Pope is by the Bible, it was just so obvious. So I went on my Facebook, you know, I only usually post things about the Pope or something biblical or, or last days. So I just posted something and I'm usually long winded, but I put like four or five words on Facebook and I put the picture of Bill Riley anxiously shaking the Pope's hand and really you can see distraught and glad to meet the Pope. And I said something like, uh, disgraced one day, and I said, meeting the Antichrist, a revelation the next. You know, and that's all I said. You know, wow. I just put a phrase there, and I'm sure I'm going to get some Adventists who, I get one or two are like, yay, Rhonda, you know, I think they're really trying to hold on that I know from Pomona Seventh Adventist Church in the 80s, but the other ones will either write me and they'll, you know, not bash me, but they get, they know not to do that. But they get very, like, agitated that I keep putting that on there, and I just, sometimes I write them back and say, can you not see what I see? We are the, we are started, we're the, this is the wheat and the tares. And I said, we started in the same place, went to the same churches. We ate at the same plates of table for potluck, went to the same evidence. Do you not see who I see? I've had people tell me in my inbox, he's just a nice older man, or why are you doing this? Or why are you bringing, per and those who may recognize it will say, why are you bringing persecution on us? So I just want to ask your opinion on just, not the Bill O'Reilly, not personally, because I know we're in the Sabbath hours. I just wanted you to comment about how anxious, like, don't, doesn't the world see that the first person he wanted to see to help to begin to dig him out of a PR mess was the Pope of Rome? Like, if, even if you were, like, clueless on the Bible prophecy, you should say to yourself, honey, or, you know, to your spouse or your significant other or your children, hmm, something just doesn't seem right. Like, he didn't want to go to... Yeah, you know, he didn't want to go to the news and clear his name. Well, not, most of us want to get on the next, next network and clear our name, NBC, ABC. He didn't want to, like, clear his name. He didn't want to hide for a while. First thing he needed or he wanted to do was go see the Pope. That, to me, that's, that's, that's like the million-dollar answer to the million-dollar question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's face it. Uh, over the last many, many years, press has bombarded the world that the papacy is good and and the pope is a is a loving father you know i remember going through atlanta several years ago the first time i'd ever gone through atlanta there was a humongous billboard through downtown and it said father knows best and there was john paul 
So Rhonda, we've been we've just been inundated with that. And so the voice and the Lord allows that, Rhonda, so that when the third angel's message that exposes the Antichrist of Scripture, when it is resurrected with with latter rain power, Rhonda, the contrast is going to be painful. It's gonna it's gonna hurt people because the contrast will be so stark from what people have heard. All right. Yes. Mrs. Fagan. Yes, uh, Pastor Hughes, thank you again for coming uh, to us. We really love you very much, you and your family. Um, I have twofold question. Number one, two, uh, we know that God is in control, but do you think there will be a nuclear warfare, especially you know by North Korea? Number one, number two, um, it was mentioned that uh, there will be um, contest of uh, Protestantism. Um, and we'll be the only one. Will the Jehovah Witness also uh, contest being Protestants? I have a twofold question, please. Okay. Ms. Fagan, as far as a nuclear war, number one, the Bible is very clear who controls the powers of the earth. Amen. Okay. Revelation 17 is very clear that the kings of the earth do what Babylon the Great tells them to do. So the papacy controls Trump in the West. The papacy controls Putin in the East. And the papacy, through the Jesuits, controls Un in North Korea. Okay? The Bible is very clear about that. The Bible doesn't say some nations. It says, well, let's read it. Revelation 17. Revelation 17, 2. Verse 1 talked about the great whore, the papal power. Verse 2 says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now, Ms. Fagan, I don't see in that verse, I didn't see the Bible saying some of the kings of the earth, a few of the kings of the earth. It simply says the kings of the earth are in cahoots with the papacy. And Revelation 17, 18 says, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So it's not a mutual, equal relationship. Babylon the Great pulls the strings of the kings of the earth. The Jesuits control the politicians in the West, Donald Trump. The Jesuits control Putin in the East, and they control Kim Jong-un, or whatever you call him. Okay? Now, Ms. Fagan... What I have analyzed as far as what has gone on in Syria, let's take both of them. We'll take Syria, then we'll take Un in North Korea. We know, Sister Fagan, that there will be a point in Earth's history when there will be a false Armageddon. Okay? There has to be because the devil... Uh, always gives a counterfeit before the true. Yeah. And the world all believes, all the evangelicals, Lindsay, Hagee, and all the rest of them, teach that Armageddon is a physical battle. And it will take place in the Middle East. Yep. Okay? Now, Sister Fagan, if the Lord allows, Russia doesn't like America, the Jesuits are pushing Putin to be antagonistic to the West, and the Western Jesuits 
have Trump to antagonize Putin in the East. Okay? If they engage in conflict in the Middle East, there could be some nuclear weaponry that's fired off, couldn't there? And that could be, Sister Fagan, the false Armageddon. Okay? Now, what if the man in North Korea or Vladimir Putin was allowed to drop a missile on a U.S. city? Okay? Now think about it. Let's take one. Let's take uh, San Francisco. All right? Many people would die. And what would the people of the United States scream for in a heartbeat? War, number one. But they would also cry out, just as they did after September 11th, for God to bless America, to keep us safe, and how would we translate that into our understanding of prophecy? National Sunday Law. National A National Sunday, Sunday Law. Law. Oh, the people would be screaming for it. They'd be screaming for it. Sister Fagan, who knows if that will happen that way? I'm just looking at the characters that we see right now on the landscape. And Un is, you know, he's really pushing to get atomic weaponry out there. Let's see what the Lord allows. I'm not saying God will allow that, but let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. Just be ready for the Lord. Well, the Jehovah Witness contest, Protestantism, being Protestant, you know, when they, the evangelist, evangelical people get together, will oh, the Jehovah Witness be part of that too or not? You know, Sister Fagan, I don't believe that um, Jehovah's Witnesses are included in that. I don't think they are. I think we're looking at mainstream apostate Protestant churches, Pentecostal, Methodist, Lutheran, um, Baptists, you know, and a host of all the rest of them. Yeah. But I, I don't think Jehovah's Witnesses are a part of that. It's in the fall, Adrian. It's in the fall. I'm sure that if you looked on the Internet, it would give you an exact date. Personally, I think it's going to be, I would think it would be closer to the time when Luther nailed the 95 Theses, which is right at the end of October. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where's the mic? Talisha has the mic. Talisha, please. Yes. Um, I appreciate, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know about you before uh, this weekend, but um, I watched one of your sermons or your presentations on, um, what's it called, slavery and Catholicism, which I thought was really, um, really inspiring and enlightening for me. But I just wanted to know, is there anywhere besides the great controversy where Ellen White talks about the Sabbath-keeping um, churches in Africa? Not that I know of, Talisha. I only know, I think there's two, two statements in the great controversy. The thing that was the, the um, spark was the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm. Because of his tremendous influence over the queen. He was her right-hand man. He, he was her <laughs> treasurer, handled the finances, had tremendous influence. And Talisha, when he received the gospel through the ministry of Philip there in Acts chapter 8, you know that he went back to Ethiopia and he spread the truth like wildfire. And then, of course, as it went through Ethiopia, it spread across Central Africa. 
and that's where Ellen White then comes in with her statement. I think it's around 54 and then in the 570s. I'd have to look them up for exactly, but that's where she makes the two statements. So what, um, what other books besides the Slavery and Catholicism is a book, right? Yes. Is there any other books to read besides that one that talks about it more in detail? Not that I know of. I, there was a lady that used to attend here. Her name was Jacqueline Miller. Yeah, Jackie. Some of you probably still yes. remember Jackie. She was a nurse, I believe. Yes. And uh, her dad, Roscoe Miller, wrote a book called Slavery and Catholicism. And after she heard me in meetings here, she came up to me after one meeting and she said, uh, the book that my dad wrote, you would absolutely love it. And so I said, well, here's my address. And she sent it to me, Talisha, and it's, uh, it's very well documented. Uh, Roscoe Miller did a, a fantastic job documents it historically, shows how it came from Africa through the Spanish and Portuguese merchants that went to Africa simply for economic reasons, to make money. But on every one of those ships were Catholic priests. And they weren't going there to make money. They were going there to convert the heathen of Africa. But the heathens of Africa, they didn't want anything to do with the papacy. So what was the result? If, if you can't convince somebody diplomatically, then you do it with force. And the way to destroy a church, a church is made up of families. You destroy the family, You've destroyed the church, and you've destroyed the truth. That's why slavery came in. And Mr. Miller documents that beautifully. Wow. Uh, Pastor Bill. Um, one, one other final note, Talisha. Check on the Internet. You might be able to get the book there. Is it on there, Eugene? Okay. Okay. Very good book. Uh, Pastor Bill, uh, very interesting. When I was in Nigeria, um, that was late uh, 1900s, uh, I went to Avia, and, uh, and I talked to the Christians there. And I, in my naivety, I asked, so tell me, who was the missionary from England that came down here and taught you Christianity? And they said, oh, no. We've been Christians here to, since the time of the apostles. Amen. In, Amen. in Nigeria. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, wow. Now, my next question was, so why is it that you are keeping Sunday, not Sabbath? Says, oh, we keep Saturday, Saturday as a day of the Lord until uh, this century when the English came. And, and we named the English. Uh, the, the name for a white man in, in Nigeria is... The, the white man that changed Sabbath to Sunday. Oh. Yeah. Wow. It's, uh, Gracie's next. you know, it's been, a, it's, it's forgotten Gracie. history. That's what it is. It's forgotten history. It's, it's history that Rome once destroyed. Once it destroyed. Who was next? Grace. Your name, okay. ma'am? Grace. Grace, please, yeah. ma'am. I have three questions. One was, uh, what happened to Charles Wheeling? Because I, I just I, out of the blue thought about him this past week. I said, I've not heard from him, haven't received any email or flyers or anything. I wonder, just wondered what happened since you mentioned his name. Okay. Number two. Oh. <laughs> oh, do you want me to answer it first? Yeah, yeah. It's, they're, they're just short questions. <laughs> I really don't know, Grace. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, my, my next question is, um, um, does Ellen White say something about feet washing, that the Pope washes the feet of the prisoners, and uh, you know that the time is near? Not, not the Jesuit, the Pope. 
and uh, Pope Francis did go to the prisons and wash uh, the prisoners' feet. And someone told me it was in, in the great controversy, but I, I haven't found it. I have never, ever seen that grace. And the only reason that I would conjure, that I would believe for why the Pope would go and wash prisoners' feet, it's simply for PR. Yeah, I believe that too. Okay, my third question is about the n nuclear war. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Ellen White says this, but I, I, I heard that God would never allow a human being to destroy the whole world because he is still in control. Does Ellen White say that? Or if you know? Well, Grace, as far as a nuclear, we nuclear weaponry destroying the whole world, See, Revelation chapter 7 is very clear that the angel's grace are holding back the winds of strife. The winds of strife. Yes. They're holding back the general engagement of world powers. Okay? Once probation closes grace and God's people are sealed, both spiritually and intellectually, into the Sabbath, the truth of the Sabbath, and sanctification. And Christ leaves the most holy place. Grace, there will be an, an engagement of the powers of earth during the time of Jacob's trouble. And there will be atomic weaponry, I'm sure, that will be used to destroy great parts of this world. Now, Grace, what the, the scenario that I was painting about the man in North Korea or Putin as well from Russia, who also has capability of using nuclear weaponry, Grace, if that were to occur before the close of probation, it would only be in an isolated spot. It would not be a worldwide thing. Because Revelation 7 is very clear. Uh, the Lord will hold back the wind. That doesn't mean that there won't be conflict. Right. You see. But the utter annihilation of this planet? No. That won't happen until after probation. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we will. All right, John. The lady that asked about... Uh, Africans worshiping in Ethiopia in the Middle Ages on Sabbath should contact Mrs. Pat Arabito, LLT Productions, P.O. Box 205, Anglin, California, for Jim Arabito's research. His hypothesis was there's always been a group somewhere in the world keeping Sabbath. You name any prior period of history. She might have some more information on that subject okay. for the lady. Excellent, John. Did you hear that, Talisha? Yeah, I have to and, and one last comment. Charles Wheeling still is in business. Same okay. address. Same. His John, wife is recovering from cancer, though, so she needs your prayers. Repeat, John, if you oh. would. Yeah, say it slow. Mrs. Pat Arabito. Pat Arabito. That's A R R A B I T O. Pat Arabito. L L T Productions is her ministry name. Okay. The ministry's name is L L T Productions. P O Box, Box. two o five. Two zero five Anguin, California. Anguin, that's A N G W I N, California nine four five zero eight. Correct. Still remember. It. And for this lady, Charles Wheeling is still in business. Same Did you get that, Talisha? Okay. All right, Jean. Um, and then, and then you, ma'am. I've seen your hand up several times. So. We'll go Jean and then the young lady right there. Jean, go ahead. Uh, uh, just a, a couple of uh, comments. Yeah. <clears throat> I stumbled across uh, uh, a video. Uh, it's already been a few months ago. But it talked about that, uh, and, you know, I can't remember if it was the father or the son, Kim, Kim Jong-il or Un. It's probably the father, but he was actually educated in, in Switzerland. So a lot of these guys, these dictators are, uh, they're, how do you say, they're uh, uh, embryoed in the West. 
probably under and then they're they're just playing out their role absolutely <clears throat> but um absolutely. also backtracking to the uh uh the king james conversation yeah there's a uh, uh a version it's not been published into an actual paper book yet you, it's it's only available online like in a i think a pdf but it's called the american king james and two conservative fundamentalist christians protestants they're not adventists but these two guys very carefully went through every single verse and they didn't change anything all they did was update it to modern english and it's really good okay and i i don't know about you guys but i speak modern english you know i don't i don't think in old english so i like to read in modern english gene i under i understand your comment and sometimes when i have been reading a a, a slide from a powerpoint program i will simply insert where it says thy i'll just say your yeah you I, see i, I do just do same. that inadvertently but gene the problem the problem that permeates seventh day adventism today you've got so many voices in a Sabbath school class, you can have six different translations. You see my point? King James was the standard Bible for Seventh-day Adventists because we understood its Protestant origins. Now, Gene, this one you're talking about, it could very well be right down the line. But I would sit, Gene, and I would say, still, what happens if, if you've got that translation, you've got the, the old King James Bible, if you have just those two? Could there be confusion in a Sabbath school program? Could there be? I haven't read it from front to back, but okay. I've, I've, I've read a lot of parts of it, and I couldn't find anything wrong with it. I mean, these guys did an incredible job. And, uh, you know, then I've heard people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, the ye means plural and there was reasons for that. No, you read a modern sentence, you can tell by the context if it was being spoken to one person or, you know, that's that's kind of a, I don't know, I would like to turn it into an actual book and with some changes like correcting the comma when Christ was talking to the thief and, and some of these other corrections and call it the remnant King James. But, you know, As you I don't have the money to. forward with it, Gene, let me know if, if you after you read through it completely they offer it in the okay. Uh, okay. pastor let me interject for a couple of seconds on regard of the christians in africa but i'm going to say there was christians uh, sabbath keeping people in america before before the vikings before the spaniards and before everybody because okay. in new mexico ha has been discovered a petroglyph of ancient Hebrew with the Ten Commandments. Uh, you can find, you look on the internet and you will see the pictures of it. Amen. Ancient Hebrew. Amen. Wow. No. Oh, by the way, it, it's being dated 2,000 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now, Pastor Cortez, this is, a, you're Elizabeth? Okay, Elizabeth, and then this gentleman right here. And then, Ms. okay, hold on, Mr. Lyle, you'll be third. Elizabeth, go ahead. Okay, so I have a question about the nature of Jesus. I, um, you know, I, he came in fallen human flesh, I think, mm -hmm. but he never sinned. To me, that makes him look different. And he, which, and I'm not trying to negate that we have to be born again and obey, but, and, I understand Ellen White said he did not have propensities to sin, which every human being is born with, and that makes him different. And I just think that should be brought into into discussion that he wasn't exactly like us, exactly. Elizabeth, the argument over the nature of Christ comes down to the simple common denominator that did Jesus have power and an advantage that we don't have? That's the issue. See, in 
from 1851 to 1951 in Ralph Larson's epic book called The Word Was Made Flesh. He shows that Seventh-day Adventists always taught that Christ didn't have an advantage. You see? Well, then Leroy Froome and Roy Allen Anderson with the book Questions on Doctrine in the 1950s came out on page 383 in the book and said that Christ was exempt from the challenges that face us today. Now, that's a paraphrase, okay? But that's what he said. And you can go back and read it. The point, Elizabeth, again, Christ had access to power to obey in our flesh just as we have the same power in this flesh to enable us to obey. You see? Yeah, I see that, but... That's the whole issue. But, but it, Ellen White said he did not have propensity. He did not have any urge to sin. Well, when you... It, it, helps, it helps a whole lot if you don't have an urge to sin. So anyway, I'm just, I just feel like there needs to be a more comprehensive... Um, description of Jesus that needs to be included that he never had an urge to sin on in his life uh, does Ellen White say that because that's what I I believe I've read maybe on some screen and, and understand that I believe does that not make him different than us uh, but I'm not saying negating everything you said but I just think there needs the whole truth needs to be told about Jesus. Elizabeth, my understanding, and I'd have to go back if you could find the quote you're referencing. Mm -hmm. um, Hebrews chapter 2 says, For he took not upon him the nature of angels, but he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Okay? So Christ did not take upon him a perfect nature. A nature like Adam before he fell. He didn't. The Bible is very clear, Elizabeth, that he took upon himself a nature like the fallen sons of Abraham. Now, that's what Hebrews 2 says. Hebrews 4 says in verse 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, that's the testimony of Scripture, Elizabeth. Um, and I would like to see the quote that you're, you're stating. Um, I'm very familiar with the statement in Desire of Ages, page 49, where Ellen White says that Christ uh, did not take the nature of Adam in Eden, which would have been an infinite sacrifice, but he took upon himself after man had been in sin for 4,000 years, you see? And so, Elizabeth, my impression of Scripture and Ellen White is that Christ was tempted in our flesh and his temptations were even worse than ours because at any point, he could have taken back the power he laid down. When the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness and said, make those stones into bread. Yeah. Elizabeth, that wouldn't be a temptation to me. Yeah. I can't do that. But Jesus could. Because he could take back the power he laid down, as Philippians 2 says. So he suffered greater temptation in my flesh than I will ever face and was victorious. 
And for that reason, he is my perfect example that if I will submit to the authority of God in my life, I can overcome too. Yeah, we can overcome. I won't belabor, but we can overcome. But Jesus never sinned, even as a little taught before he... He never sinned, Elizabeth. So, anyway. He's our example, but I just feel like there's something a little different about him because of it. Elizabeth? Yeah, Romans 8, 3, and 4. Let me go back, Elizabeth. See, in Luke chapter 1, in Luke chapter 1, well, let's read it. Let's read it. Luke chapter 1. Verse 35. Verse 35. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that what, Elizabeth? What does it say? Well, I have I have an NIV, so you Okay. <laughs> okay. This is what the KJV says. It says, therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Okay? Now, can any of us, can any of us at birth, when I had my son, can I say, he's a holy thing? No. can when Christ was born, and Elizabeth, I, I appreciate your questions. And in all fairness with what you're saying, Christ was born with the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not. Okay? okay? So there is, in that sense, there is a distinction. But the power of that Christ was born with is the same power that you and I have access to when we accept Christ as our Savior. Amen. You see? I, like, I like that explanation. Okay. <laughs> that helped. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, no, wait a minute. This gentleman right here and then Mr. Lytle. All right. Go ahead. Your name, sir? Donald. Donald, yes. please. Uh, to the gentleman's um, quotation he made of, of the two different Bibles that yes. he read, uh, I think we ought to stick to the Bible. It says Revelation twenty two nineteen. Do not change, add to the scriptures, whether it's a quotation, a period, or whatever. Okay. Jane. Gene, hold on. He, Donald said, he feels at peace sticking with the King James Version as is, period, end of discussion. Based on Revelation 22, 19. Fair enough? Okay. Now, Eugene, if you want to chat with Donald after the meeting is over, you guys enjoy each other. We're moving on. Mr. Lytle, go ahead. Pastor, my name, my name is Jim Lytle. And I, the question I have is, uh, I was here last night, and the name uh, Ganyon Diop came out, up. And I just the question I have is, I understand he's uh, of the Public Affairs Religious Liberty Department of General Conference. Yes. But what is disturbing to me is, as recently and I've come to some information about his involvement with Pope Francis and this uh, ecumenical movement thing or whatever's going on there. Um, my focus is on the fact that Pope Francis or any other pope is antagonistic to religious liberty. So what is the association between Gagnon Diop and his meeting with Pope Francis with this uh, effort to bring about this one world government? And where does the General Conference stand on his activities there. Mr. Lytle, that meeting when Diop 
and I'm not going to try to say his first name. Ganun Diop. That took place last fall. During the election time, Mr. Lyle, let, let's put it in the context of a great controversy. We've got little time. We've got little energy. We've got to put it into the promulgation of the great controversy, the real book, The Great Controversy, spreading it all over the world. Doors are closing in Russia and in other parts of the world. At that very time, Ganun Diop, and I had it on a slide. I think I shared it last time I was here. He was at a meeting in Rome. He was the Adventist representative. Just because he's the religious liberty man had nothing to do with it. This meeting was all about ecumenism. And all of the major religions of the world were there in Rome. Mr. Lytle as a representative of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the General Conference President, what in the world is an Adventist doing there? We have nothing to do with ecumenism. Ecumenism is the antithesis of the three angels' messages. It's the absolute antithesis. And Diop was there representing Seventh-day Adventism. And I remember in a quote, and I've got it on that PowerPoint, it's um, trumped again. Francis makes a statement where he says, we, we all were gathered here to find ecumenical unity in Jesus. And Mr. Lytle, I'm thinking, what Jesus are you talking about? This, this is the devil masquerading as an angel of light and Adventists have been playing the ecumenical card for so long, we don't see it anymore. We don't see it anymore. It's very scary. It's very scary. And when we go into any meeting, anywhere, we better listen with our ears wide open to what we're being told. And if it doesn't click and hit firm, we better get up and get out. Because it's a scary time. Deception is rampant. Rampant, Mr. Lytle. All right, we got Donald, we got Mr. Lytle, we got Elizabeth. Who is next? Yes, ma'am, in your name? No, Leticia's right up in the front, to the right. Leticia. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wrong again. <laughs> Leticia, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, in Ezekiel, somewhere in Ezekiel, God is complaining about what the people in Israel were doing, worshiping towards the east, where the sun rises. Yes. Now, as a Christian, um, should I be careful when I kneel down to pray to God, not to, um, not to kneel towards the east? Uh, he talked about it's an, abom an abomination. Yeah. Leticia, that's found in Ezekiel chapter 8. And Ezekiel was being shown the abominations of the ancient Adventist leaders at that time. And Ellen White applies Ezekiel chapter 9 to our day. So Ezekiel chapter 8 applies to our day as well. So Leticia, what that is teaching is, is that Seventh-day Adventist leaders are worshiping the sun god Baal. And that's what Ezekiel chapter 8 was identifying. Now Leticia, if, if I'm in my home, and, and I kneel to pray, if I make a conscious effort and say, well, I'm going to pray towards the sun, well, I would be real hesitant to do that. But Leticia, if, if you're in a crisis, and maybe one of your 
a child gets hurt or a friend is, has to rush to the hospital and you want to pray earnestly for them right there, and you fall down on your knees and you happen to be facing the sun, I don't think the Lord cares. You see what I'm saying? This, this Leticia and Ezekiel 8 was a deliberate honoring of the sun god Baal in defiance of the creator. That's what it was. It was an act of worship. But for you to be praying earnestly and you happen to fall and you happen to be pointing towards the sun, that's a very different situation. Okay, one, one more question. Uh, yes, this, this one is about, um, is it wrong for a Seventh-day Adventist Christian that wants to be faithful to God to accompany my relatives to a Sunday uh, Protestant church service or to a funeral? that is in a Catholic church? Leticia, to go to a funeral, I don't think there's anything wrong with going. If it's a wedding in a Catholic or an apostate Protestant church and it's a friend or a family member who are not converted, I don't see anything wrong with going and supporting them in that. But if it's just a regular Sunday service that my mother is going to? <laughs> Leticia, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. Okay. And what I would do is, if it's a family member or a good friend that you're close to, I would express to them that because I love Jesus, and he's the Lord of my life. I don't want to hurt him in any way. And he's called me to worship him in his house on the seventh day Sabbath. And so, and then I would say, I appreciate the offer, but I just wouldn't feel comfortable meeting in that situation. That's what I do. Thank you. You're welcome. Somebody else. All right, Betty Jean. <laughs> Adrian, go ahead. Have you witnessed thing or any pastors with the NLPs? Um, have you did anything on that to watch and look out for? Neuro linguistic programming. I, I've seen. I was looking at a PDF. Their their teach. They had it at Andrews University. It's online, and they're blatant with us right there. You can see what they're doing. You know, Adrian. There are very subtle things that ministers did, um, and still do. I'm sure that are involved in NLP. Uh, I think it's gone way beyond that now because it graduated from NLP to spiritual formation. And um, spiritual formation, Adrian, I feel is an, is an advanced um, NLP where people are taught to empty their minds, to look to their minister as the ultimate authority. Uh, and uh, very subtle, very subtle, Adrian, but um, I think that's where this has gone. The NLP was in the 80s, 90s, maybe earlier, but I know 80s and 90s when, when I was familiar with it. And then, of course, uh, spiritual formation was voted into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 2001 by a committee of which Ted Wilson was a member. Now, whether he voted for it or not, I don't know. But he was on the committee that made the teaching of spiritual formation mandatory for pastors, teachers, evangelists, and scholars within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. A 
loveless. He was, he was into NLP and uh, spiritualism. That's what he was. It's imagining. Imagining. Empty your mind. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Joe, right here. Joe, get the mic. Thank you. Uh, but, but Lovelace, I have watched uh, Pastor John Marcuson's uh, DVD, and in, in, in one of those DVDs, he said, uh, in fact, in one of the, the, the meetings of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, uh, workers, he was the keynote speaker, and he told them, that every Sabbath he hypnotizes the church members. And he was encouraging other ministers to do the same thing. <laughs> now, uh, William is, 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 my question is, is it here possible in here in, in USA that the secret terrorists, you know who, who the secret terrorists are, will create scenarios to justify enforcement of martial law, which will possibly pave the way for Sunday law, national Sunday law. second when these people um, Alex Jones Gary Kaw uh, and others when they use the terminology martial law I always take that Joe and I say okay they have some understanding as to what's go what's happening and what's going to happen in the future but they don't understand the great controversy and they don't understand the the issue around which the whole world will spin they don't understand that and we do through the great controversy through revelation 13 14 17 we understand it thanks so much so when they use martial law i translate it and i say what they're referring to is a shutdown of all freedom and we know that, Joe, will happen when a Sunday law is passed. Okay. It was Douglas, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a question. Uh, okay, a, on a state level, our government is... I would say extreme left, but on a national level, we have turned to an extreme right government, nationalist, meaning if anybody's going to pass a, a Sunday law, it would have to be the religious right, okay, or a, a government that, that the religious right could control. We've seen Britain uh, exit the EU under their nationalist uh, government that they have now. And now tomorrow, they say France is on the verge of doing the same thing. Is this something that we could look to, to uh, as one of those things to, to let us know the time is near? Because more countries turn into an extreme 
less moderate form of government that could possibly do and enforce such a thing? I think it absolutely is a sign, Douglas, that, that we are getting extremely close. There's no doubt. Um, Douglas, I'll tell you, California, I think the governor out here is still Jerry Brown. Yeah. Yes. Now, Jerry Brown is a trained Jesuit. Trained Jesuit. But he's a fanatically liberal Jesuit. On the national scene, Douglas, we have a man who was also trained by the Jesuits. Donald Trump was trained at Fordham University, okay? His son, Eric, graduated from Georgetown University. I think it was in business. So on the national level, Douglas, we have a trained Jesuit conservative. The Jesuits control both sides of the spectrum. Well, we, we mandated vaccines, which was unbelievable. So. Sure, sure. Douglas, the fact that the Republicans and the religious right will pass a Sunday law, that most surely could be the case. But I would not hold out the fact, Douglas, that liberal Jesuits on the far left could do the same thing. Because really, Douglas, the, only, the one thing that it takes, as we found with Oklahoma City exactly. and 9-11, you create a crisis, or as somebody mentioned, a false flag, the Hegelian dialectic, and then, Douglas, to answer the terror or the evil that you created, they give you the answer. Sunday. Synthesis. So it could happen, Douglas, with the liberal Jesuit or the conservative that controls both political parties in America. Uh, one last thing. Locally, there's uh, over the last month, there have been about... Uh, Two, or I think three small earthquakes centered around Loma Linda. Is there anything in the writings that says they're going to get hit by a big earthquake? Douglas, I don't know of any specific quote, but I will say this. Apostasy, Douglas, always has its consequences. And the apostasy that is going on in this area at Loma Linda University, Douglas, there will be a consequence. And it will be ugly. You look at Jerusalem of old in 70 AD. For their apostasy, Douglas, for rejecting Christ and the messages of the apostles, there was a consequence. Their blood ran down the steps of the temple. And Douglas, when God finally says, this has gone too far, judgment will follow and it will be ugly. Right here in this area. Now, I think that's all the questions. Isn't that what you said? I, I guess, oh, wait a minute. Bro Brother Duca, Duca is breaking all the rules. <laughs> but because he's an elder. <laughs> yeah, I got a question for you. <clears throat> we know that we lost one of our hospitals in Washington to the St. Mary Catholic Church. And if you read the, the editorial... The editorial says they went into debt because they retrofitted, did some new construction, and couldn't pay back the $60 million that was in, inferred to the death, the debt of uh, that hospital. Um, there's a hospital around here that's going and building uh, a big, big new hospital. And what I found out was that 
all the resources that the university has uh, has been put up in collateral for this new hospital. That's not public knowledge, but now you guys know. What do you think, and just from your own perspective, if we can't pay the finances of that new hospital, what do you think can happen? The Washington hospital that we lost is an example of what can happen. What's your take on that? Eddie, I think, I think the Washington example has the writing on the wall for Loma Linda. They're getting into horrific debt. And Eddie, the consequence will be Loma Linda University, the hospital, the medical center, will be taken over by Rome. And Eddie, that could be a part of heaven's judgment to say, you know, you have gone so far away from what I called you to do. I'm just going to give you up to, to your choices. You have followed the Catholics. You have embraced the Catholics. You have allowed the Catholics to take over. Now I will give it to them. And I think that's where we're going, Eddie. And you know the amazing thing, Eddie? It's like in the days of Eli. The ark had been taken. The Philistines were the controllers of the world. Eli was dead. His sons were gone. The ark is in the hands of the Philistines. It looks like God's work is over. But in the midst of all of that apostasy, there was one man. And God had been training him all along, pre preparing him for that very moment. And he stepped into those shoes. And Israel became great for a long time because of Samuel. Samuel the prophet. So, Eddie, as we see God's people being taken over by the Philistines and the ark of God being trampled in the dust. God is preparing us to stand in the gaps, to fill the hedge, and to stand for truth. John, you have such a gentle smile. On your face. <laughs> Let's do this. Just I'll a minute, John. If you want to pass, wait, that's up. Just a minute. Do you have that? You have a microphone, Betty Jean, right? Good evening. Thank you so much for taking my question. Your um, name, ma'am? My name is Sharita. Sharita. Yes. Um, what do you? What is your understanding on the economic situation in the world and also the United States and how that affects us and what we should be doing right now to prepare for it? Sharita. The appearance is that Donald Trump, the businessman president, is really helping the American economy. Sharita, in all that I have seen, I have not heard one word about the trillion dollars of debt 